welcome everybody. We have a special recording today I'm doing with Daryl Eberhardt on his latest article and email. It's a movie review of a very, very important message. And this message was the message that was, I believe, started by the Morning Star of the Reformation years ago, way, way back now. That would be in the 14th century, if I'm not mistaken, with John Wycliffe when he translated the Bible from English, you know, from the Latin Vulgate, excuse me, into English, the common vulgar tongue of the time. And by doing so, he declared war with the entire Roman Catholic hierarchy. And they came after him with a vengeance. But there was a very, very wonderful advantage that John Wycliffe had at the time. It was that he was actually really in, already in a very frail state. And he was able to avoid the full blow of the Inquisition at that time. He did not face the, should we say, the wrath of the Antichrist at that time. So, Daryl, I think we're ready to head right into our topic for today, which is Martin Luther. Right, and I'm going to give a, just a real quick snapshot of my background, because it kind of fits in with Martin Luther, because Martin Luther started out, in case uh, folks don't know this, Martin Luther didn't start out his life as a Protestant. He didn't start out his life as a Lutheran. He didn't start out his life as a dissenter from the Church. He, start, he was born Roman Catholic, and that's an important thing to point out. Martin Luther was born Roman Catholic. Uh, his dad uh, slaved away, I believe, and I think he was a minor, but he says uh, he slaved away to put uh, slaved away for many years to put Martin Luther, give him a chance that he never had in life, uh, to go to college. And he wanted Martin Luther to, um, to be a lawyer. So he sent him to, for law. And we'll get into that background a little bit more, but Martin Luther uh, was a, a Roman Catholic, uh, and he went to uh, college uh, to become a lawyer, and he switched his job, uh, or his, uh, his major from, <laughs> from law, and he switched it to religion because he became an Augustinian friar, an Augustinian monk, and then he became, two years later, a Roman Catholic priest. So Martin Luther was not a Protestant, Martin Luther initially, and Martin Luther, uh, he was a, a Roman Catholic, and an Augustinian monk, and friar and monk, and then uh, a Roman Catholic priest. So Martin Luther was trying to work within the Church. He's a Roman Catholic. We need to remember that, because a lot of people are ignorant today of history, unfortunately. We, we're history challenged here in the USA. So we'll keep that in mind that Martin Luther did start out as a, quote, Protestant. And I wanted to give a, a little bit of my background before we start into the movie so that people know that, well, that number one is that I love a lot of Roman Catholics. So this is not a, meant to be a Catholic bastion bashing session, and we often uh, mention that. But uh, I just want to give my, quote, uh, my love of Roman Catholics credentials, if uh, I could, and that is that, uh, like, my dad was Roman Catholic, my mom was Methodist. So I was brought up in a home where my mom was Methodist, my dad was Roman Catholic. Now, because my dad had a, an alcohol problem, I hardly ever saw him at home, but... Um, and he often came in very late at night because of the alcohol. Uh, but my mother was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. And so uh, as when I give my dedication here, uh, it's also dedicated to my mom because as um, Moses, uh, in, if you've seen the movie Ten Commandments, he says when the, they start jumping on his mom, about, his adoptive mom uh, was a... Uh, I think the sister of the Pharaoh and Bithya, 
was her name, if my memory serving me correctly. And because of the stroke that I had, uh, I've kept, thank God, most of my long-term memory. My short-term memory is what I've got problems with. But but uh, when they started jumping on Bithia about her background of being an Egyptian princess, oh, how dare you sit down at the table with us when they were having the Passover and had uh, put the blood on the doorpost to uh, uh, keep the plague away from them. Uh, when they started jumping on his mother, his adopted mother, Moses, is ado- I'm not comparing myself to Moses, folks. But anyway, they started jumping on his adopted Egyptian mother, Bithia, princess, and they uh, said, how dare uh, a pagan woman sit down at our table? And uh, in the movie, Moses says, this woman helped set my feet uh, on the path of education and stuff and that. And so my mom, even though she used an NIV Bible and uh, uh, belonged to what I would call a very liberal branch of the so-called Protestant mainline denominations, my mom did set me on a path that will tie in good when I get to another part of this session here. But my mom set me on a path that uh, didn't give me uh, tons and tons and tons of Bible, but it gave me some of the beautiful stories from the Bible. So anyway, my love of Roman Catholic credentials are these, that my dad was Roman Catholic until he died. Uh, 90, probably 90 to 95% of my relatives and my friends, including some of my best friends in high school and that, were all Roman Catholic, still are Roman Catholic. And so if somebody wants to say, oh, how dare you speak against uh, the Roman Catholic? By the way, most of my first cousins and uncles and aunts are Roman Catholic, too. I'd say at least 90 to 95 percent of them. So if somebody wants to say, oh, you're Catholic bashing and you hate Roman Catholics, well, then you're going to have to say, I hated my dad and that I hated and hate do hate most of my uh, first cousins and uncles and aunts, which is a bunch of baloney because, you know, I love them. The fact that uh, they're in a system that pretty much uh, it, it keeps people in the dark, let's put it that way, as to what true Christianity is supposed to be. And we'll get some into that also when we get into my catechism classes that I went to. So somebody wants to say this is Catholic bashing. No, it's not. Uh, we wouldn't even be bothering uh, taking the time to do a session like this or to talk about someone like Martin Luther, who, by the way, again, was born Roman Catholic, Augustinian uh, friar, Augustinian monk, and a, an Augustinian priest two years after he became a friar. Uh, no, um, we know of many, many, many famous Roman Catholics throughout history who have stood up against the church uh, when the church was in the wrong, and the church often is in the wrong. The Roman Catholic Church is often in the wrong and tends to kill you if you speak out against them. But they burned um, uh, Jan Hus, uh, John Hus in the English, uh, H-U-S-S, uh, was burned at the stake. Uh, uh, they burned a number of people uh, that were people of theirs or, or had them executed, uh, who spoke out and tried to reform the church from within. And uh, Savonarola comes to mind, and we won't get into all the dates when these people existed, but uh, the the church has a long, long track record of murdering people, and that's why we're going to bring this out, be, uh, because Luther ended up with a hit contract, a mafia-style hit contract on him to have him killed from the highest levels of the Roman Catholic Church, and also uh, from the uh, devout Roman Catholic Emperor, Charles V. So, again, uh, I love many Roman Catholics, and I married a, a, a Roman Catholic uh, lady, and I went to catechism classes. I never, and we'll get into that, but uh, I went to catechism classes and uh, got thrown out, uh, probably one of the few people ever thrown out, because I knew a little bit of Bible, and we'll get into that. Um, I think it, it might not be bad to mention those those three things right now. But uh, uh, what happened was that uh, when I got married in 1968, uh, I got married right before I was headed for 
uh, uh, I think it was uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate Arabic, I'm sorry, intermediate Russian at Syracuse University. And uh, I agreed to go to uh, catechism classes uh, because, again, my wife was Roman Catholic. She later got got out of that church very quickly after she saw what happened in the catechism classes. But in the catechism, I'll get into the catechism class here because it's interesting because it ties in well. And in the catechism class uh, that I went to, and it would have been uh, late 1968, it would have been, I guess, the winter of 68, 69, but um, I went for about six weeks, and it was one of the worst winters ever in Syracuse. The snow was like real deep. And so I went to about six sessions, and let's say about the second session. I don't remember exactly which is which, but I know they were about two weeks apart. Um, I I said uh, to the priest, excuse me, my hand went up, uh, excuse me, why do we call you guys Father when none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says in the Bible, call no man on earth your father. And he means not your earthly dad. He's talking about a spiritual leader. You don't call them father or you don't make a big deal about them or anything. And, uh, and of course, he goes, is that in the Bible? And I goes, well, yeah, it's in the, uh, the Gospels. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. And so you can see well, as I go along here that I'm starting to make him look 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 like he's not doesn't know his job. So we go a couple more sessions, maybe about the fourth and session. And he, I goes, excuse me, and my hand goes up, and I can see a little sweat on the. I'm joking, folks. I don't really see sweat, but he was nervous. And I said, uh, uh, why do we do? Why do you guys do repetitious prayers, or why are we be learning repetitious prayers like saying lots of Hail Marys and lots of Our Fathers? Nothing wrong with the, saying the Our Father, but you don't do it as a rote prayer and say ten. Our Fathers and 50 Hail Marys, which is often the recipe. Uh, and I says, why, we do, why do you guys do repetitious prayers uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, don't be like the heathen, uh, heathen, don't be like the pagans, don't be like the heathen and do a bunch of repetitious prayers. And the priest goes, is that in the Bible? And I goes, yeah, it's in the Bible. I wasn't a, a big Bible scholar, nowhere close to it at the time, but I knew a little bit. And so uh, we go a couple more sessions, and up goes my hand again, and now the priest is really getting nervous. And I goes, excuse me, why are you guys celibate? How come you're, you're celibate whenever uh, the Apostle Paul in two different books, and I think it's like in Titus and Timothy, one of the Timothy books, epistles, but he gives the qualifications for a bishop slash elder. It's the same word in the Greek and for a deacon. And he says, married to one woman, married to one woman, and having your children under discipline in that. And he goes, is that in the Bible? And I goes, oh, yeah, it's in two different epistles of uh, letters of the Apostle Paul that are part of Scripture. And he goes, are you sure? And I goes, yeah, it's in the Bible. And he goes, oh, and that was the session where the priest comes up and puts his arm around my shoulder and says, my son, you don't have to come back anymore. And I says, you know what? The weather is getting really terrible and the snow's getting awful deep and I hadn't planned on coming back any, anymore anyway. So I'm not poking fun. I'm just saying, because I ran into a lot of Methodist pastors, ministers, reverends, who likewise were very, very biblical, ignorant, and admit that they went to most of their classes, remember, a very liberal denomination, Methodists, and I have to say that they admitted to me, oh, we had maybe one or two Bible courses, but everything else that was administrative stuff, it was like how to uh, have fundraisers, how to do counseling, uh, how to uh, have uh, different uh, social affairs in the church, uh, how not to offend people. I'm joking, folks, but <laughs> they pretty much did that kind of stuff. And and so I'm saying uh, there's a lot of biblical ignorance amongst the so-called Protestants, amongst the so-called evangelicals, 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but and not so it's not just among Roman Catholic priests or Roman Catholics. As a matter of fact, probably there are some Roman Catholic uh, lay people, people that sit in the pews that know much more Bible uh, than the the priest that's up there where he does a homily and does a little reading from the scripture, but you can bet that they never read anything about calling no man father, not doing repetitious prayers like the heathen or pagans do, and or him reading the part that gives the qualifications for a bishop slash elder or a deacon uh, being married to one wife. Um, I'll bet you they never read those, and I know they didn't because I went to several uh, uh, Roman Catholic services with my dad. Uh, just uh, and I never converted to Roman Catholicism, so don't let them do like they were trying to do and say Lincoln was an apostate Catholic when they wanted to steady the hand of some of the uh, Roman Catholics that uh, were that tried to kill him. By the way, and uh, and eventually uh, he was killed by. A, uh, a rather uh, large conspiracy Abraham Lincoln was uh, that that tied in very very much with a Jesuit front group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. They changed their names about three times, but their oaths were all very very Jesuitic, I guess we could say. But anyway, that's another story. That's a, a whole different. Uh, uh, you could do a whole YouTube session on that. I think we have talked about Lincoln before, but the, the assassination of Lincoln. So anyway, my religious background was is that I had a Roman Catholic dad, and I had, uh, often he was very non-practicing. He, he did go to the services and collect, uh, he was a, what do you call those people that take up the collections? Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, he didn't really get into it uh, that much, but uh, that's my my religious background, and I just wanted to give it because we're going to get into, again, Luther's background in that. So with this article of mine that I did, uh, and I did it back around December 31st was the date I put on it. I worked on it for a couple of days, and I put a dedication in here, and I put the primary dedication of this article goes to the wonderful, magnificent Word of God. By the way, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was the living Word. Uh, if you read John uh, chapter 1, uh, it's one of his titles. He's the Word of God. And uh, the written Word of God, the Holy Bible, and so the primary dedication goes to the wonderful, magnificent Word of God, the true Holy Bible, and especially the true Holy Bibles in these two following languages. Uh, the best English language Bible, the Old King James Bible, and the best Spanish language Bible, the Reina Valera Gomez 2010 RVG 210 Bible. Um, I, I, and I have three secondary dedications on this besides the one to my mom that I threw in there, but it's not Ooh, in there. By the way, so. Daryl, if you don't yeah. mind, I'm going to just sure. re remind you that the people that collect the offering are the ushers. Yes, he, my dad was an usher. And he collected. He and they collected also give the out offering. bulletins, right? So when you get to the yep. church, they greet you with smiles and mm -hmm. usually a handshake, and then they hand you a bulletin and invite you in and even show you where to sit. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you reminded me of that because that's what my dad was. He was an usher in the church for many years. By the way, he was a Knight of Columbus uh, for many years. Uh, okay, uh, the secondary. I have a, about three secondary dedications, and they're important ones because. The, Another dedication goes to the very, very courageous German man, uh, religious reformer, and again, former Augustinian friar, monk, and Roman Catholic priest, Martin Luther, who lived 1483 to 1546. Not too far off from another guy whose name started with an L and had six letters, uh, Ignatius uh, of Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuit order. They, so they were contemporaries, but they never, I don't think they ever met. And then another secondary dedication of the article goes to another, uh, a very courageous German female, a German woman named Katharina von Bora Luther. And she uh, lived 1499 to 1552. And she, of course, was became the wonderful wife of religious reformer Martin Luther again, who started out as an Augustinian monk, friar, and priest. And that's important to keep in mind that we don't forget that this was a Roman Catholic 
individual, Martin Luther, who tried to work for reform within his church from the inside of the church, trying to reform the church, not to start uh, a Protestant denomination. His job was he thought he was going to clean up the church a little bit, and he ran into a buzzsaw called the Roman Catholic Hierarchy and uh, the emperor, Charles V, and we'll get into that more. And then another secondary dedication of this article goes to another very courageous German man that most people in the United States have never heard of, Duke or Prince Frederick III, the wise. He was one of the electors of Saxony. He lived 1463 to 1525, and he was a big protector of Martin Luther, and uh, he's portrayed in this movie very well. Uh, for being a very wise and courageous gentleman. He's the one that really saved Luther's life because they put, a, like I said, a hit contract out on Luther. We'll get into that more. But between the church and state, uh, they basically put out a mafia hit contract on Martin Luther for trying to work within the church because the church often doesn't like you to try to reform it from the inside out. As Oh, there were some other people, too, uh, like whenever they tried to get infallibility put through, there was a guy named uh, Von Dollinger, who was a, probably one of the top scholars in the Roman Catholic Church. He died a very suspicious, very convenient death uh, because he was speaking out against papal infallibility, and they didn't like that. So anyway, let's get into the... Uh, do you have any questions up to now, Brett? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking about uh, the catechism. You know, it's interesting how that word came about. I find it's from a Latin root, and yeah. I have a historical reference of the year 1502, and it comes from the word, uh, ah, my Latin isn't good. So it's like a cate catechismus, if I might say. And I think it's interesting because that was a uh, was that a, a Roman Catholic term then? I must would imagine. Be. Yeah, would must imagine. Be. Oh, and I wanted to give just real quick my background because my military background is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I I went straight from high school to the U.S. Air Force, spent twenty years in the U.S. military, divided between the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army probably about uh, closer to, to uh, two-thirds of it in the Air Force and the other th a little bit more than a third in the U.S. Army. 26 years total in the U.S. intelligence community. Of course, 20 of that was in the military, but six years of it was as a D DOD, stands for Department of Defense Civilian, in a top U.S. intelligence agency. I got lots and lots of foreign language training in Russian and Arabic. Uh, I got to go to Egypt, by the way, twice, temporary duty, TDY, mostly from the Air Force was the uh, Russian and Arabic uh, basic and intermediate Arabic language training. I have a BA in Russian from the University of Maryland that I picked up when I was stationed in the, had switched over to the Army when I was stationed in Berlin, Germany. So I got a lot of uh, credits that from my previous language training. Uh, a lot of it was straight university credits, especially the Russian language that was at Syracuse University under contract with the U.S. Air Force. I was stationed at Offutt Air Force Base. And uh, twice at a I had really sweetheart assignments. Uh, twice at Athens, Greece, with the U.S. Air Force, I flew on RC-130 and RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft, and that's what the R for Romeo RC stands for. RC-130 it means a reconnaissance aircraft. So I flew on RC-130 and RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft, and. I was stationed three years when I switched over to the Army, and my first assignment was to Berlin, Germany, with the U.S. Army, three years. So I love German food and Greek food, so I got a lot out of that. And I was stationed at the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, was an instructor for my last four years in the U.S. Army at the U.S. Army's Intelligence Center at school at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I taught a class on the Middle East, and I sponsored uh, and escorted. As a matter of fact, I escorted four Egyptian generals uh, that were visiting there, and I, because of my background, and I spoke uh, uh, Egyptian uh, halfway decently, 
Um, because of that, I got to uh, be an escort officer, and I sponsored a number of officers, including uh, an Egyptian uh, lieutenant colonel and an Egyptian major. Uh, had them over to my house for dinner and stuff like that. So I've got a pretty good background in the Middle East, and uh, I liked uh, those Egyptian officers, and I liked the Egyptian people when I was uh, temporary duty there. But I just wanted to throw that out because it's an interesting background. And uh, whenever I wrote this article, one of the first things I put in here was an important warning, and that is history, much of our history that is well, most of the history that's found on the Internet has been heavily what I call sanitized, revised, and edited. Many books of authors, and I have lots of them, from the 1800s have either, number one, disappeared completely, number two, are very difficult to find or track down to at this very day, and or number three, are labeled as, and you'll find this on the Internet frequently, as anti-Catholic. So if you tell the truth about history, and uh, the history of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you're labeled as anti-Catholic. They just throw a label on you, and it's using the old and tried tactic of ad hominem, in another Latin term, means to the man. You attack the man rather than discussing the subject. So you can bring up a, uh, a, a ton of true history from secular uh, historians that don't have, including Roman Catholic secular historians like uh, Peter DeRosa, uh, Lord Acton, uh, who who very, very much uh, point out uh, uh, Roman Catholicism's uh, quite frequent murderous ways. And so, uh, again, it, rather than discuss anything like the Inquisition, a real dis, honest discussion about it, or like Luther found out when he tried to have a discussion with the learned Dr. Eck, Roman Catholic scholar, he found out very quickly that uh, what the Church did was resorted to ad hominem attacks because they, can't, they couldn't stand on, on truth because truth isn't, most of the time, isn't on their side. And so many of our encyclopedias and history textbooks, likewise, have also been heavily sanitized, revised, or edited. And because what happened is over a century ago, we got a lot of Roman Catholic priests and their agents, mostly priests, and that made tremendous strides in their efforts to, number one, infiltrate and get on textbook selection committees, and also to get on talking with uh, different encyclopedia companies because they gave a warning to those companies, threatened them with like economic boycotts. Uh, these various encyclopedia companies, they were told to, to uh, exercise or uh, to rid their encyclopedias of any entry, entries that were considered hostile to Roman Catholicism, particularly to the papacy, and or to uh, various Roman Catholic orders, such as the Jesuits, and especially the Jesuits, and you you will find out that that's what what has happened. So again, uh, one of the very best movies, and we're going to get into the movie that I have ever watched, is in black and white. And actually, I've watched several that I love in black and white. One of them, and I'm not recommending it. I'm just telling you that I like it a lot, and that is high. High Noon uh, with Gary Cooper, which is a Grace Kelly, kind of an interesting movie. But anyway, we're not getting into that. But that's one of my favorites, and it's in black and white. But the one that we're talking about that is one of my very, very favorite best movies that I ever watched in black and white, it was made in 1953. And the name of this outstanding movie is Martin Luther. And it's got lots and lots, and I like this, just like whenever... I read the book of Esther. There were lots of heroes and lots of villains. And then if you ever read the book of Esther, and we won't get into it here, but there's a bunch of heroes like Esther, whose real name is Hadassah, I believe, in the uh, Hebrew. Her Jewish name was Hadassah. And, uh, and there were and Mordecai, uh, the Jew, was another one of the heroes. And then there were some real nasty villains like Haman. And so uh, in this movie, there's lots and lots of heroes and villains. And we're going to get into 
uh, we're just going to run down real quick, uh, like about, I think I've got about eight people named here, but two of Germany's greatest male heroes are portrayed in this movie, I already mentioned them, the well-known religious reformer Augustinian, uh, Martin Luther, and Luther's most powerful supporter, much lesser well-known, uh, uh, is the Duke or Prince Frederick III. He was nicknamed the Wise. He was one of the electors of Saxony. That means that he was one of the guys that was one of the chief electors when they elected an emperor. You know, they had different electors from the big city states and from the the, the most powerful provinces. But the, the free city states and provinces were the ones that elected the emperor uh, from the so-called Holy Roman Empire. So, uh, by the way, there's also a very good color movie, which I also tell folks is it, it complements it very good. It's called Luther, and it stars Joseph Finney's. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, F-I-E-N-N-E-S, as Martin Luther that came out in 2003. The two movies complement each other. But the movie that I would most recommend that people see is this one called Martin Luther and uh, – I had had it around here somewhere, but it is the big 50th anniversary edition. There it is right in front of me. It's called the 50th anniversary edition, Martin Luther. And uh, again, it's black and white and uh, one of the very, very best movies I, I've ever seen. And we we can't forget uh, the heroes of the faith that had the courage. Uh, here you had a man that stood up to both church and state when they were both very much in the wrong. So the first guy we, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk eight people here real quickly because they're the, the heroes and the villains of this, this interesting movie. And the first one is, of course, is I'm going to go by alphabet. So the first guy is Aleander, or you'll see it written Alexander. Anytime you've got people who have Latin names, have Italian names, have other names in different languages, you're going to have like three or four versions when you go up and look them up on the internet. But Girolamo, in other words, Jerome, and he became a cardinal eventually. Aleander, spelled Alexander, but Aleander, which is in the Italian language, Girolamo Aleandro. Uh, and of course, we've got the uh, got a Latin version also, but he was born and died 1480, 1542. He was a Roman Catholic prelate, which is a high-ranking person within the church. Jerome Alexander, Aleander, was appointed a nuncio to Mainz, M-A-I-N-Z, Germany, to arrange very important indulgence cells for Germany. So he was very big at the time when Tetzel, Johann Tetzel, who was a famous Dominican, we'll get into him, or cover him in a minute. But uh, anyway, uh, he was the Aleander was supposed Aleando uh, was supposed to uh, be uh, kind of big in making sure that uh, money was raised to help uh, refurbish refurnish uh, the uh, the papal treasury. So anyway, he got appointed a nuncio to Mainz, Germany, to arrange very important indulgence cells. He later was assigned to help conduct the trial of courageous religious reformer Martin Luther before the parliamentary assembly at the Diet of Worms. And no, they're not talking about earthworms. That's the name of a city in Germany, W-O-R-M-S, at Worms, Germany, in 1521. And Aleander, Aliando had earlier attempted to persuade the courageous Duke Prince Frederick III, Elector of Saxony. He wanted him to turn Martin Luther, who was a subject of the Duke Frederick III, he wanted him to turn him over to the Inquisition because the church had decided that that uh, Martin Luther had to go because he was cutting into their profits. P-R-O-F-I-T-S, not the other prophets, they prophesy, but uh, they he was cutting into the prophets. Anytime you cut into the churches or any big organization's prophets, when you start touching their wallet, uh, they just not only want to slap your hand, they want to sometimes cut it off or cut your head off or do worse. But anyway, to uh, the great credit of this courageous Duke Prince Frederick III, 
he refused to turn him over. He refused to turn him over to the Inquisition. So he was putting his neck on the line because he was a Catholic ruler at the time. He was very powerful. He was uh, over uh, the region called Saxony. And uh, to stand up to a Roman Catholic prelate and say, no, I'm not turning him over to the Inquisition. He'll be tried in Germany if he's tried anywhere. So anyway, our second character, and she's a very, very courageous woman, is named Katharina von Bora. And she was born, died 1499-1552. She became the wife of German religious reformer Martin Luther. And she, by the way, was a former Roman Catholic nun. She had ran, run away and escaped. And uh, this was when the Luther had started making his protests known. But this uh, former Roman Catholic nun, Katharina von Bora, had the great courage in 1525 to marry a man. And then we're talking about religious reformer Augustinian Martin Luther, who was at that time under an edict, in other words, an excommunication by Pope Leo X. Now, this is what isn't one of the good guys. This is one of the villains and the emperor's ban or curse. So the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which was a devout Roman Catholic named Leo X, and the uh, he was also under the emperor's ban, and that was, again, Charles V, or his curse, that's what they called it, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which many people sometimes joke that was never holy, and it wasn't really Roman, but they called it the Holy Roman Empire. This emperor, uh, a devout Roman Catholic named Charles V, the emperor had declared Martin Luther outlaw, which meant that any German that came across Luther's path could and should murder him, kill him. In essence, the state and church, in other words, the state being the Holy Roman Catholic, the Holy Roman Empire, excuse me, and uh, the uh, pa papacy basically had put out a hit murder contract on German religious reformer Martin Luther, who started out as a Roman Catholic. So the great courage of, Rome, of Katharina von Bora, which she exhibited when she married Martin Luther, is very accurately portrayed in this 1953 black and white movie, Martin Luther. Third character we're going to talk about is one of the, another one of the villains. That's Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, 1500 to 1558. He was emperor 1519 to 1556. He was a devout Roman Catholic, Holy Roman Emperor, who presided over the trial of German religious reformer Martin Luther, who, by the way, was still Roman Catholic up to that time before the Parliamentary Assembly at the Diet of Worms in Germany, as we said, in 1521. The emperor condemned Martin Luther at this trial. And again, he declared Martin Luther outlaw, again, meaning that anyone crossing Luther's path, any German that crossed Luther's path, not only could, but should murder him. Then the fourth guy, we've got eight characters to look at, brief synopsis or whatever of their background was, and I like this guy quite a bit. He's in both of the movies about Luther that I've seen. He's portrayed quite well. Duke or Prince Frederick III, the wise, the elector of Saxony. He was born in 1463, died in 1525. Very courageous man. He's relatively unknown, again, as I stated earlier, in the USA. And the Duke or Prince was, Frederick Tree was the German elector of the so-called Holy Roman Empire. When religious reformer Martin Luther was condemned by both church and state at that parliamentary assembly at the Diet of Worms in Germany, 1521, Duke Frederick III quickly had Luther kidnapped. I have kidnapped in quotation marks because, you know, it looked like uh, a nasty kidnapping was taking place where they're going to murder him. But instead, the the kind, good-hearted, wise, courageous Prince Frederick III had Luther kidnapped and taken to the Wartburg Castle that's right next to the town of Eisenach, Germany. Prince or Duke Frederick III did this faked kidnapping in order to prevent Luther's murder, because he knew they were going to kill Luther. And if he hadn't done that, uh, there would have been no Protestant Reformation. Luther would have been a dead man. So the 
the great courage exhibited by this Roman Catholic elector of Saxony at the time. He was a, a devout Roman Catholic. Duke or Prince Frederick III is quite well portrayed in the 1953 black and white movie Martin Luther. The fifth character is a, a villain, and that's Pope Leo X. And he was born in 1475, died in 1521. He was Pope, uh, looks like only about eight years, 1513 to 1521. And I call him a greedy, pompous religious leader because he was the Pope who condemned and then excommunicated German religious reformer, Augustinian, by the way, Martin Luther, who had been an Augustinian friar and monk and had also been a Roman Catholic priest. Pope Leo X was a... I put this, uh, this is a label I'm putting on him. He was a lover of indulgences, and he often sold various church offices, such as archbishoprics. And this practice is called simony. That's a term that is believed by some, you'll find it in some dictionaries, to have been derived from an individual named Simon Magus. Uh, or Magus, but um, I think Simon Magus, a, a Samaritan sorcerer who lived in the first century A.D. and who is mentioned in the Bible in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24. And there's a, a scene in this movie that shows Pope Leo X bartering, in other words, haggling like you're in a marketplace, with the brother of young Prince Albert of Brandenburg over a third archbishopric. Now, I think at the time you couldn't hold more than two, but they're trying to get this guy a third archbishopric. He wants to be Archbishop of Mainz uh, for this Prince Albert. So the, the, the brother is there, in, shown there in the, the papacy, uh, bartering, and haggling over this uh, position that he wants given. So the immense greed of this high-ranking Roman Catholic prelate, Pope Leo X, is portrayed in this movie, Martin Luther, 1953, black and white. So as the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil, and we're, this ties in a lot with what this movie is all about. Okay, the sixth character out of the eight that we're going to mention, and these are the main characters, the heroes and the villains alike, the heroes and villains in this tremendous movie. Martin Luther was born in 1483, 1546. He died. Again, former Augustinian friar and monk, former Roman Catholic priest. So in 1501, German-born Martin Luther entered the University of Erfurt, and that's spelled E-R-F-U-R-T, which is located in pretty much in the center of Germany, in central Germany, when uh, Germany was divided at the end of World War II into eastern and western sections, it would have been in East Germany. But he went there in order to study law, and his, his father wanted him, to, you know, to have a much better uh, life. Uh, than the father had, who had spent years working in the mines. So Luther spent, Martin Luther spent four years at the University of Erfurt before he decided that he needed to make a career change. In other words, he was changing his uh, his uh, major in, uh, in uh, college or university, but he switched from law to religion. So Luther began his religious career in 1505 when he entered the Augustinian order. Remember, he's Roman Catholic at the St. Augustine's Monastery in Erfurt as a friar. Two years later, 1507, he was ordained a Roman Catholic priest. In 1511, Martin Luther came to Wittenberg to be a parish priest. And by the way, Luther loved people, and he loved uh, preaching to the people, so he was a, a, a people's priest. Luther received his Doctor of Theology in 1512, that would have been one year after he came to Wittenberg, and he entered the faculty of the University of Wittenberg in the same year. Of course, now Prince, or uh, if you would have Duke uh, Frederick III, really wanted to make uh, Wittenberg a famous college uh, to kind of uh, match uh, what was at Ingolstadt and uh, at Oxford and that. So he wanted to uh, get the best teacher he could, and that uh, to uh, be a, uh, a an instructor or whatever at that that school. So anyway, that part is pointed out very much in the movie. 
So anyway, uh, in response to Johann uh, Tetzel's indulgent cells in Germany, that's what really got Luther's ire raised, shall we say, got him very non- unhappy. Um, Tetzel's indulgent cells, and he was, by the way, a uh, what you would call a Holy Roman uh, Empire Dominican. He he was actually part of the empire's thing. He wasn't just in Germany. But anyway, Johann John Tetzel's indulgent cells in Germany got courageous German religious reformer, Augustinian at the time, Martin Luther, uh, so angry that he wrote his 95 theses in Latin. And his 95 theses were quickly translated by some of the German people into the German language and soon spread not only over much of Germany, but also over much of Europe. In case you can't tell, I think the world of Martin Luther, he wasn't perfect. He didn't go as far as he should have, He, but he sure as heck had a lot of courage. So, but anyway, when Martin Luther was condemned by both church and state at that parliamentary assembly we mentioned at the Diet of Worms in Germany in 1521. Duke Frederick III, the elector of Saxony, again had Luther kidnapped for his own good and taken to the Wartburg Castle, which is located again right next to the town of Eisenach, Germany, pretty much the dead center of of Germany, modern-day Germany. And Duke Frederick had this kidnapping again carried out in order to prevent Luther's murder. So while Luther was at the Wartburg Castle, you can see, find that on the internet, nice pictures. It's a beautiful looking castle. Luther translated, I think he was there 10 months, Luther translated the New Testament into the German language, fulfilling one of his top goals to get the New Testament into the common German man's hands in a language that he could read and understand. And at the end of the One Color movie, and I'm not going to get into it, but one of Luther's very good friends was a a Dutch priest named Ulrich Wender. He's cruelly burned at the stake when he's captured just because he was associated with Luther, burned slowly at the stake. So the great courage of German religious reformer Martin Luther again portrayed very, very well in this 1953 black and white movie. And then we have the seventh character. We've got eight of them. George Spalatin. And if you go up and look on the internet, you don't find out much about him. Oh, he was a a humanist. And he was, no, he was a real good hearted man who became a Roman Catholic priest. So let me tell you about George Spalatin, seventh character. He's one of the heroes. 1484 to 1545, he was the secretary to Duke or Prince Frederick III, the Elector of Saxony. And this courageous German was a law student, fellow law student with Martin Luther. At the they don't tell you that on the internet, many places. He was a fellow law student with Martin Luther at the German University of Erfurt in the early 1500s. Now, Spalatin was a pseudonym that George Burkhart took. Now, Luther himself had entered the University of Erfurt in 1501, but uh, like his friend Martin Luther, George Spalatin gave up his pursuit of a law career in order to become a Roman Catholic priest. Now, whereas Martin Luther, soon after leaving the University of Erfurt, first became an Augustinian friar before he became a Roman Catholic priest two years later, Spalatin, when he got out, he immediately became a Roman Catholic priest before coming, becoming a tutor for the nephews of Duke or Prince Frederick III, the Elector of Saxony. George Spalatin also served as the Duke Duke Frederick's secretary. He was in a very powerful position. He became, oh, he was clo- very close friendship with Martin Luther and his support of Luther. Uh, that's very, very well portrayed in this 1953 black and white movie, Martin Luther. Again, if you can't tell, I think the world of this movie. Eighth and final character that we want to examine of our list of heroes and um, villains, and if we had any uh, uh, noisemakers or something, we could go uh, boo or hiss. This guy was a, a real piece of work. He was named Johann John Tetzel, uh, definitely a villain. He was born somewhere around 1465. People aren't sure, so that's one of those things when you look it up, it's listed as circa, meaning approximately around that time. But he, he died in 1519. He was a Roman Catholic Dominican friar. He was also the inquisitor for Poland and Saxony. 
So, you know, the Dominicans had uh, the Inquisition for a while. Of course, someone took it from them and ran it. Uh, some, when some people say the Jesuits took it over, really. But anyway, Johann Tetzel was a Dominican friar of the so-called Holy Roman Empire. And he had an ind- he was I, what I would call an indulgent salesman extraordinaire. Johann Tetzel had been born in Saxony in Germany. Tetzel had been appointed, again, Grand Commissioner for indulgences for, again, all of Germany at the time. Tetzel had also earlier, as we mentioned, been appointed the Inquisitor for Poland and then Saxony. Johann Tetzel's abuse of his license, so-called, to sell indulgences in Germany brought him into conflict with a Roman Catholic Augustinian priest named Martin Luther, who's one of the heroes. In fact, Tetzel's sale of indulgences in Germany was a major motivator for Luther to post his 95 theses in Latin, which were quickly translated into German and then widely distributed through Germany and throughout many other parts of Europe. The great salesmanship, in other words, in his sale of indulgences of Johann Tetzel, is very well portrayed in this 1953 black and white movie, Martin Luther. And again, as 1 Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Again, it doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, but rather the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, there's great research went into this uh, movie, and narrator John Wigan uh, makes comments at the beginning of the 53 movie, Martin Luther, and these are very, very interesting uh, comments. And at the beginning of the movie, we we read the following about the extensive research that did go into the making of this, I call it a super informative movie production. Here's what it says. This dramatization of a decisive moment in human history is the result of careful research of facts and conditions in the 16th century as reported by historians of many faiths. People don't want you to believe that anymore. They want, no, this is all made up stuff and it's just Protestant uh, propaganda or something. No, there. if you go back and study Catholic, many Catholic historians and so-called Protestant historians, you're going to find out that this movie portrays pretty much exactly perfect to the letter and number what went on there. So now at the beginning of the movie, we hear this narrator, John Wigan, comes in and stating the following. And this is important. He says, 1,500 years after the birth of our Lord, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the lands and people of Central Europe comprised the Holy Roman Empire a strange and mystical commonwealth which compelled allegiance both to emperor and pope. Key word, compelled. Powerful in this political structure were the rich states and free cities of Germany, like the one we were talking about, Saxony, where Frederick III, the wise, ruled. So powerful in this political structure were the rich states and free cities of Germany, whose princes and counselors commanded armies pledged to defend both empire and holy Roman church. The pious, talking about the devout Roman Catholics, believed God himself had established dual authority over Christian man. In other words, Roman Catholic man. They accepted the emperor as ruler of life on earth and the church as intercessor for man's destiny in the world to come. The church had largely forgotten the mercies of God, and instead it emphasized God's implacable judgments. And that's what is portrayed with Tetzel going through and collecting all this this money uh, for indulgences. Back to the uh, narration. Even Jesus Christ was presented as a relentless avenger, and man himself so hopelessly engulfed in sin that he must live in perpetual dread of a furious God. Painted constantly and vividly before his eyes were the fires and torments of hell. Because this was a moneymaker with purgatory. Big moneymaker. Remember what I read about the love of money. Back to the narration. Narration. The early 16th century was a time of deep-rooted superstition and fear. 16th century. Christianity was mixed with elements of paganism. And men believed the world was filled with demons. And now the old King James calls them devils and evil spirits for protection and deliverance from eternal damnation. The church demanded absolute 
and unquestioning obedience of the people. In other words, you raised any questions about the role of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, in the Holy Roman Empire, or about the emperor and the uh, other authorities of the various provinces and regions and city-states, etc. If you raised any questions, you better be ready to be squished. And I mean squished like an elephant stepping on a chipmunk. Anyway, back to it, it says, and the movie starts out with another thing. It says, on a midsummer's day in 1505, about a decade after Columbus discovered the New World, a young law student made his way through the marketplace in Erfurt, Germany. His name was Martin Luther. And this is where the movie really kicks off with the scenes of the different actors portraying the roles. And they're going to start out with Lu- pretty much with Luther's visit to Holy Rome, indulgences that could be earned by religious acts. And, and so they portray this Augustinian monk, Martin Luther's visit to Holy Rome. I put holy in in quotation marks, because it was wasn't very holy at the time. Uh, they had a lot of brothels and stuff for the clerics. But anyway, which was at the time very far from being holy. Indulgences are one of the key topics in this movie, 1953 movie, Martin Luther. When the Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, he's sent there by his, with a fellow Augustinian monk, by the way, sent on a mission to the holy Holy Rome by their superior, and I believe he was at the time the vicar general of the Augustinians, Luther is told about some of the indulgences that were available at that time for visiting pilgrims. And we're not being mean or anything. This is what was really happening. So here for some examples, uh, I tell people, please see the paragraph immediately below. So at this part of the movie, you hear the voice of the Augustinian vicar general. He's sending Martin Luther off, and so He's telling him, and so you're going to hear his voice about what he needs to do or see when he's in so-called holy Rome. He goes, you must not fail to hear a mass before the altar of St. John in Lateran. There's a short pause, and then you hear, the again, the Augustinian vicar general telling Martin Luther, set in a certain wall, you will see two crosses. Behind one cross, the relics of Peter. Behind the other cross are the relics of Paul. An act of faith performed there will relieve your soul of 17,000 years in flames. Folks, a lot of this, they still tell you you can get indulgence for making visits to various Marian apparition sites, etc. This still goes on, that you get time off in purgatory, which is a fictional, no basis for it at all in the true Holy Bible. Uh, you have to go to the Apocrypha or something to find anything about something like purgatory. There's heaven and there's hell. Uh, there's no in-between place called purgatory. It's not in the Bible. Okay, back to the narration. And, and the monk is evidently told had told uh, Luther to see this. He says, be sure to see one of the 30 pieces of silver for which Christ was betrayed, for it carries an indulgence of 14,000 years. Now, where does anyone come up with all of these exact number of years and that for indulgences and that? And you get another pause, and then you're, you hear the voice of the vicar general saying, and be sure to also see the scala sancta, the very stairs which that Jesus climbed in the palace of Pontius Pilate. And our father said on each step earns nine years indulgence. And on the step where Christ fell, you will see a silver cross for that step, a double indulgence. And then you get another pause. And then you get another scene in the movie is Luther's reaction to his Augustinian superiors, quote, hog harvest of relics when he went into the lowlands. And these are relics whose veneration could earn the venerator. This still goes on to what? Today, if you go up into Marian perpetual adoration sites and that, you can you can get time off of your – you can just earn different things by adoring the monstrons. But anyway, here's what happens. Uh, in this movie, 1953, black and white, Martin Luther, it shows how much time the veneration of relics could earn the venerator off of his stay in purgatory. So we hear the Augustinian vicar's voice saying the following about his recent harvest of relics from the lowlands. He goes, and of course, there, he's, these things are put in like 
glass cases and stuff. But he says four fragments of Saint Jerome. He means a bone of the Saint Jerome. Of Saint Jerome. Then there's a pause. Now remember, he's got a whole bunch of people standing around him, including the Catholic priest, Roman Catholic priest uh, George Spalatin. And Martin Luther is standing off to the side listening. And he goes, and we've got two of St. Chrysostom. And it means two fragments of a bone. You get a pause. And then he says, and from the veil sprinkled with the blood of the Savior, and there's a pause, a morsel of the very bread eaten at the Last Supper. Another pause. And then he says, and this, another pause, with a nail take driven into our Lord's dear hands. Pause again, then you hear a fragment of the true cross. And then he pauses and repeats the same thing, you know, a fragment of the true cross. And people are all looking at it, and some people are bowing down already. And then he says, he tells, I think he asked Spalatin at the time, he says, give me the list. And he goes, pauses, with these relics, as in all the others I have brought, if a pilgrim were to venerate every single relic in our church, he would be give, forgiven of his time in purgatory, 1,902,202 years plus 270 days. And in this movie, you can see Luther starting to get a, a look of disgust on his face that they can come up with this preposterous number of years off from, the, from people's time in purgatory by venerating all these relics. In other words, the vicar general is saying, if you if you venerate each and every single one of these, you'll get 1,902,202 years plus 270 days off. And, and as soon as he says that 270 days, you can see Martin Luther start running out of the room uh, disgusted. And, he, and uh, the vicar general turns and he goes, and now Brother Martin, who was standing there, and uh, they, they, the vicar general get kind of lost sight of him and goes, uh, uh, Brother Martin. And of course, Martin Luther's not there. So the vicar heads into the room where Martin Luther is right after this has occurred, probably within minutes. In private, uh, Martin Luther tells the vicar, hey, sir, uh, mankind only needs Jesus Christ, not the veneration of relics. Luther then adds that man lives by faith in Christ alone, alone, and that it is that person's faith in Christ that makes a man righteous and not what the man has done for himself, whether it be the adoration of relics, the singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome where you go and view a couple or a bunch of uh, relics, or the purchase of pardons for his sins but rather by faith in what God has done for man already through his son. And then you have Tetzel uh, showing his salvation for sale or salvation on the interest plan. When uh, Pope Leo wants to replenish, wanted to replenish the papacy's treasury through a much wider sale of indulgences, through the sale of cardinals' hats uh, to those who would could and would pay for such hats through the sale of archbishoprics, like we pointed out uh, to the uh, Archbishop of Mainz, uh, to the highest bidder. And there's a long scene in the movie that shows Pope Leo X bartering or haggling, as we mentioned, with the brother of, um, I'm trying to think here, let's see, the brother of Prince, young Prince Albert of Brandenburg, and uh, it shows him bartering with him for that third archbishopric. So again, uh, he already has two archbishoprics, and the uh, somebody points out to the Pope that that's against canon law to hold three, I guess, at the time. But John Tetzel, Dominican of the Holy Roman Empire, is shown in several scenes of this movie selling lots and lots of indulgences in Germany, and making lots and lots of money off of those sales. So again, Pope Leo X was relying heavily on a wider sale of indulgences to help build St. Peter's and to help replenish the papal treasury. And again, it's worth repeating. 1 Timothy 6.10 again says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not, again, the money that's the root. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. 
And so uh, I'm going to take a little sip of Pepsi. Would you like to say anything, Brett? Oh, sure. You bet. I was just thinking about that myself, is what an incredible story this is. The story of Martin Lord, Luther. I an, I'm on a long distance call. <clears throat> and it's, uh, wow, I mean, you've got all kinds of aspects of this story. Because look, Martin Luther was simply just a law student. And he started looking into, well, what's behind the law? Where does the law come from? Wow, yeah. look what he discovered. He never, I bet you, he never thought that he would become part of the priesthood and discover what he discovered. And you know, it was his, his pri- well, the prior, but not so much the prior, it was the vicar general uh, that is portrayed in both of the movies that I saw of Luther. That was the guy that sent him to study scripture. He told that Luther that he says, if you're looking for Christ... Look in Scripture. And so they figured that uh, they would get him to be studying Scripture. Now, of course, they would be studying uh, the Latin that was the Roman Catholic Latin Bibles, but they still, the, that for him to be a professor, a doctor at uh, at the uh, university uh, uh, under uh, the Duke or, or Prince, as they called Frederick III in Saxony, They wanted him to be knowledgeable in the Scripture, so that guy set him on the path to looking into the Scripture, and the more that Luther looked into the Scriptures, the more he found out that uh, there was a lot of uh, doctrines and practices within the Roman Catholic Church, not just indulgences, but that was one of the main ones that got him going, is that there were many uh, practices and uh, doctrines within the Roman Catholic Church that didn't square with what the Bible said. And and Luther is a portrayed in both those movies as he was in real life, a very inquisitive person. And he questioned things. And uh, from the scriptures, he just started more and more and more seeing that there was something wrong, very wrong with the Roman Catholic Church. And that. so uh, the next scene uh, that we find out he gets a drop off of indulgent cells, and uh, this is a a major scene in the movie because um, there they show. I put here the disappointment, but a bit more dis- more than disappointment. There was a, a quite a bit of anger, so I think I'll I'll add that to later. But uh, there was a lot of anger expressed by Pope Leo X when he learned that the sale of indulgences had dropped off significantly since Martin Luther who was then an Augustinian, his writings, especially about indulgences, began to be widely read by many Germans. So I think they show one scene where Tetzel is sitting there moaning and groaning that his sales had dropped off like four-fifths or something. They had about one-fifth of the normal take of money. And again, Pope Leo X, he's not one of the good guys. Soon after being informed about this big drop in profits from the sale of indulgences, He gives Martin Luther, or he gave Martin Luther, an ultimatum of basically 60 days to retract his writings or face excommunication. Of course, Luther finds out about it on the day before it expires so that he can give him much notification. And then you have another scene, Dr. Martin Luther's debate at Leipzig with the Roman Catholic scholar, the learned John Eck, Johann and we a lot of these names have been anglicized, but his name in German is Johann, Johann, uh, Doctor John Johann Eck, and uh, the 1953 movie very well portrays this debate that occurred at Leipzig, Germany, between Roman Catholic scholar, the learned Doctor John Eck, on one side, and Doctor Martin Luther, Doctor Andreas Karlstadt, a fellow. Uh, professor at uh, at the university and Philip Melanchthon, these three guys on one side and Dr. Eck on the other side. Dr. Eck, of course, representing the Roman Catholic side and Martin Luther, who is a Roman Catholic at the time, as is Andreas Karlstad and Philip Melanchthon. Uh, they're representing the side against indulgences. Dr. John Eck is defending the sale of 
indulgences. And some of the hot points of contention that occurred at this debate and are shown in the scene in the, the 1953 black and white movie are occurred when Martin Luther pointed out a couple things to uh, the learned Dr. Eck. He says, number one, the church was founded on Jesus Christ and not the Apostle Peter, as the Roman Catholic Church maintains. Now, this is a very hot-button issue, even with the the Roman Catholic Church to this day, because they maintain that the Apostle Peter is what the church was founded on. And and uh, but uh, here's what happens: uh, Martin Luther maintains or maintained that his authority for making the statement that the church was founded on Christ and not uh, Peter, he says uh, his authority for making that statement was none other than the Apostle Paul. And that's right after that. Eck had named off a bunch of church fathers who who uh, disagreed with the Apostle Paul and had Peter as the foundation of the church. And very clearly, the Bible teaches that there's no other foundation that, be laid, that can be laid other than Jesus Christ. And now the other hot button point that uh, Luther hits in this scene is he goes, and this happened really, he goes, it was not necessary for salvation to be subject to a Roman pope. And, of course, Dr. Eck flies off the handle. He goes ballistic, as we say today. The learned Dr. Eck says, Luther, hey, Martin Luther, do you think you're the only one who knows the truth? And Luther replies by stating the following. Uh, I tell you what I think. I I have the right to believe freely, to, to be a slave to no man's authority, to confess what appears to me to be true, whether it is approved or disapproved, whether it is spoken by Catholic or heretic. And Dr. Eck comes back, then you deny the authority of the Pope. Dr. Luther goes, well, listen now, in matters of faith, I think that neither council nor Pope nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny Pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Dr. Eck goes, heresy, Dr. Luther, heresy. And Dr. Luther goes, heresy? So be it. It's still the truth. And, of course, they got into screaming the match that uh, that's that's the same heresy that John Huss stated and all that stuff and and, and Luther says, it doesn't matter who says it, whether a heretic says it or a Catholic says it, it's still the truth. You know, live with it. It's true. So based on these preceding events, including the debate with Dr. John Eck, the Augustinian vicar released Martin Luther from his vows to the Augustinian order. One of the movies that's shown to be a very kind act, and I think even in this black and white movie it's shown to be a kind act because he wanted Luther to be freed up to, to speak his mind but he also was protecting um, the the uh, he was protecting the Augustinian order, of course. But after he was he had been put under heavy pressure from uh, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, including from papal Rome itself, that's he was told to uh, either call, uh, rein in uh, Martin Luther and shut him up or do something. So it's kind of he's being nice to Luther, but he's also protecting his own. You know what? So this Augustinian vicar tried very hard to warn Martin Luther of the grave danger that Luther was facing by continuing as a a Roman Catholic priest to continue his challenge of some of papal Rome's unscriptural doctrines and practices because basically he was saying people who challenge papal Rome go before the Inquisition and get burned. So shortly thereafter, as already mentioned, Luther gets his official warning from the Pope Leo X, an ultimatum of 60 days to retract his writings or fake excommunication, and he gets it one day before it runs out. But like many of Luther's many of later, many of Luther's writings were burned on orders from his own Roman Catholic Church. And the next thing we're going to talk about is his trial before Emperor, devout Roman Catholic Emperor Charles V and Jerome, or Girolamo, Aleander, or Alexander, uh, a very uh, high-level prelate of the Roman Catholic Church. And so uh, this, uh, the 1953 movie, uh, Black and White, Martin Luther, 
again, portrays the trial of a German religious reformer. Again, he's an Augustinian still at the time. He's still a priest in the Catholic Church, although he's been excommunicated. Martin Luther at 1521 at Worms, Germany, with Emperor Charles V presiding. And so, and I love these different things in here that are shown very, 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 very true to history. When asked if he, Martin Luther, would retract his many writings, and they were mostly in pamphlet and booklet form, Dr. Luther replies. Now, this is the first time and uh, uh, he's told, asked to retract it, and he says, I, I need more time. I thought I was coming here to have a debate. And, you got, and the guy says, no, no, you have to answer the question. Uh, are these your writings? He goes, yeah. Well, then do you recant? And, uh, and he asks for more time, and the emperor nicely gives him one additional day. And so the second time he's there, the second day, he says, um, I am asked to retract these writings. In other words, he's asked to recant. But they are of different kinds, and some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. I am only a man and not God, but I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, if I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. And then Luther, that's a courageous thing to say in front of uh, a high-ranking Roman Catholic prelate and also who becomes a cardinal. Some movies show him already a cardinal there. I don't know. There's debate as to when he became the cardinal. It doesn't matter. He's a high-ranking prelate. And when Luther gets asked again, because uh, they're trying to pin him down, if he will recant or not, because you know, that's all they want to know. Are you going to recant this or not? And he says, you ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by Scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, and unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. took a lot of guts to stand up to uh, the emperor and to a high-ranking Roman Catholic prelate at that, at that uh, location there in Worms, Germany. And to, to say that, that's one of the gutsiest statements ever made in the history of the world as far as I know. Uh, and of course, we have other martyrs that gave their lives and were... Uh, murdered for their testimony that gave very courageous answers. But this was a very, very courageous answer at a trial where both the emperor and, as already stated, a high-level prelate of the Roman Catholic Church were presiding, uh, with the emperor being the top presider. Well, although you could say that the, uh, the Roman Catholic prelate also had a lot to do with the the excommunication and the uh, him being declared outlaw. And that's what was the uh, effect of this, is that he was declared outlaw. So um, I've been covering quite a bit here. Do you want to say something while I take a sip of Pepsi? Sure. You know, Daryl, <clears throat> I've been listening to you, and I think, well, you know, come to think of it, wasn't Martin Luther a whistleblower? <laughs> I would and imagine it, he was. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, because he saw things in the church that he thought were wrong. Yeah, he would have been a, a uh, I guess we would say, a 16th century, because that'd be the 1500s, right? A 16th century whistleblower. That's correct, Daryl. So um, it's important that 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 we remember Martin Luther, because... He wasn't. He wasn't uh, a Protestant initially. He was a an Augustinian. Again, started out as a monk, a friar, and then a monk, and then he became. And two years later, he became a priest, and he tried to reform the system from within. And we've seen many, many instances uh, where people try to change 
or reform the church from within, especially the Roman Catholic Church, and that doesn't go over good. And usually uh, if you get a, uh, uh, what do they call those, a safe conduct thing uh, that often, as we pointed out, doesn't work, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Uh, If you get a a trial, often you get your tongue pulled out ahead of time or something, or you more or less, fig, literally sometimes, but figuratively many times, you're not allowed, there's no debate. You you think you're coming for a debate and you get there and they tell you, you got two options. You answer this thing, this one question or two questions, and it's usually recant or die. And that's it. That's the debate that goes on. So anyway, um, this is a, is an important topic. It's an important topic to talk about, and uh, I would uh, urge everyone to watch that movie. Just go up and watch it, and it's uh, again black and white, but it's one of the best movies that I ever saw. And we're touting this because Martin Luther, by the way, ended up translating the New Testament into German in a, a language vernacular that the the common man could read. And so, um, very important. Uh, God was in control of those events, despite having a murder contract, uh, mafia-style murder contract, basically put out on him by church and state. Um, he, God preserved him, protected him through uh, Prince or Duke Frederick the Third, and uh, who kidnapped him for his own good and uh, put him, hit him away at the Wartburg Castle uh, near Eisenach and um, basically saved Luther's life. And uh, despite having a a murder hit contract out on him from church and state, God preserved Luther's life. And Luther, they never got to Luther to murder him. Uh, So Luther, I forget how many children he and Katharina von Bora, they had a a slew of children. And... uh, Luther lived a fairly happy life with his wife. He's Now he's vilified, and uh, they've tried to uh, make him out as he was very anti-Jewish, etc., and yet we find out through history that the biggest hater of Jews has been the Roman Catholic hierarchy and, and for the last four centuries, uh, the Jesuit order. So people that say that the Jews run everything, well, then you better have the Jews running the Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuit-controlled Roman Catholic Church, is the one that has has persecuted uh, the Jews, not just during World War II, but for century after century after century, as, as was pointed out in uh, an article that I had written many years ago, called uh, Bloody Hands and Wicked Hearts, where I got into a lot of uh, uh, the mass murder of Jews from different pogroms or pogroms, some people call them, but massacres. These things were going on for centuries in Europe. The Jews were blamed for everything. Uh, if uh, if uh, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague or the, the black plague or whatever you want to call it, uh, when plague broke out or something, they, they blamed the Jews for doing it, and they would uh, herd Jews into synagogues and burn the walls down around them. When they had some of their crusades to the Middle East, they tuned up. If you you like that analogy or find that an interesting analogy, they tuned up for the crusades by g- going through uh, some of the western uh, provinces. I think they're Anjou and Poutot, in uh, France, where they practiced up by killing Jews, hurting Jews, uh, trampling Jews under the uh, knights' uh, horses and stuff, uh, burning them alive in synagogues, uh, uh, doing horrible things for century after century after century. Um, The Jews have been horribly uh, persecuted and vilified Uh, by Jesuit controlled papal Rome, but even before the Jesuits came along, they were still (coughs) killing Jews and blaming them for uh, the, uh, what shall we say, the big conspiracy that had Jesus Christ crucified was a church and state, the religious leaders, (coughs) excuse me, and the uh, Roman authorities uh, collaborated uh, 
a conspiracy. They conspired to put uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to death, but it wasn't the Jews and it wasn't the Romans that killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think Brett will agree with me 100%. It was mankind's sins. It was our sins that nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross, that he died for our sins and he died in order to he when he died on the cross he said it's finished it's a finished job it's a finished it's an it's an accounting term in the greek it means the debt's been paid in full it's a finished thing and that's what that's what kind of started to bother luther is it's a finished uh job that was done or mission finished mission that the lord jesus christ carried out to the very end that he carried it out completely, you don't need anything added to it. And that's why Luther emphasized correctly that it was faith in Christ alone and not by the buying of indulgences and uh, uh, visiting relics, etc., etc. It's not what man does. It's not man pulling himself up by his bootstraps. It's not uh, Greek philosophical stuff. It's not uh, by being in line with a sacerdotal system. It's not by, again, paying masses and uh, buying people's way out of a purgatory, which doesn't exist. He just kind of started noticing, and he didn't notice everything, but he did notice a lot of the, the doctrines and practices within the church, including indulgences, were wrong. And that's all he wanted. He wanted to he wanted to clean the church up, much like Savonarola and others that, that preceded him, John Huss, Huss uh, the Bohemian, and that they wanted to clean the church up from the inside out. And um, as that's already right, stated, Darrell. they were convicted in their own hearts, and they knew things did not match up, and they were led of the Lord. To do his will on earth as it is in heaven, as it says in our Lord's Prayer, it is not always an easy thing to do. A lot of things stand in the way, especially the power of this world, the prince of darkness, who wants to usurp everything Christ has made for his own diabolical purposes. And this is yeah. the struggle we live with to this day. And that's why I said there's some similarities there because it, I, I knew enough that what I had learned from reading in the Bible that something was wrong. And whenever I went through, started that catechism course, they gave me a little booklet, uh, and I forget the name of it, but I think it's Father Smith Knew Best or Knows Best, and it basically started to give you some of the catechism, and I started noticing, as other people who have, like Richard Bennett did, who dearly departed Richard Bennett, who was a Dominican, by the way, uh, for 22 years, he was a, a, a Roman Catholic priest. And Richard Bennett said he began to start noticing stuff that, hey, the Scripture says this, and and these guys are doing, you know, are, aren't are in line with Scripture. And that's what Richard said. He noticed more and more and more as he saw some little pieces, bits and pieces of Scripture that, hey, the the doctrines and practices of the church are not right. And um, you mentioned that wonderful book by Dr. L Lorraine Bettner, uh, Bettner. Why don't you just tell them real quickly about that? Oh, yes, Bettner's the book, book Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Bettner. Now, Lorraine is a, is a male name, right, Daryl? Yes, because I thought he was female. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, he was a uh, a professor, was it? Or uh, I know he was a scholar. Born on a farm, I... he graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary in eighteen or sorry, nineteen twenty eight, and where he studied systematic theology under the late Doctor C W Hodge. Previously, he had graduated from Tarkio College, Missouri and had taken a short course in agriculture at the University of Missouri. In 1933, he discovered the honorary degree of Doctor of Divinity. 
Excuse me, I said discovered. It was received. He received the honorary degree of Doctor of Divinity, and in 1957, the degree of Doctor of Literature. He taught Bible for eight years at Pikeville College, Kentucky, having resided in Washington, D.C. for 11 years and in Los Angeles for three years. He lived in Rockport, Missouri until his death in 1990. Dr. Bettner's books, other books, include The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, Studies in Theology, Moral, excuse me, Immorality, The Millennium, and A Harmony of the Gospels. And that was taken that, from the, uh, the inner flap of, of the book, Daryl. And I, I thought that book is a tremendous book. It was one that I gave my, my best friend's first wife died of cancer. But the thing that pretty much brought both of them out of the Roman Catholic Church after being many, many, many years in the Roman Catholic Church was when they read Dr. Bettner's book, because Dr. Bettner, unfortunately, it's been out of print for quite a while. You can still buy some used copies. You can search Oh, on you the got Internet. a story behind that, too, don't you, Daryl? You looked into that pretty deep, didn't you? Well, actually, yeah, because I talked with, I wanted to get more copies of the book, and, and the Conversion Center used to carry it. Now, the Conversion Center is, um, they're located in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. Now, uh, the secretary is in North Carolina, and that's where they were at one time, in North Carolina. And uh, she wanted to republish it, and she wanted to have the Conversion Center to republish it. And you know what? Uh, she called up the uh, uh, the people that put, published the book. It wasn't it Protestant Reform something or that, but anyway, the publishers uh, said they wouldn't, weren't going to republish it. And she said, "Well, how about letting us uh, republish it ourselves?" No, nope, no, nope, we're not going to republish it, and we won't let you republish it. And so that was what happened. Uh, that tremendous book, which, by the way, the reason it was so good is that it was very laid back. Uh, there was nothing uh, caustic or vitriolic, to use a couple big words, nothing caustic or vitriolic or nasty in it. Dr. Bettner just sat down, and he very calmly says, okay, here's what the Bible teaches, and here's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. And like I said, um, that book basically was the book that caused two very devout Roman Catholics, both of, of them at the time Eucharistic ministers. And people who are Roman Catholic know what I'm talking about. They both taught, I think, the CCD or something, the catechism classes at the church, but they were both from very devout, large Roman Catholic families, and they, they basically, uh, it was not easy for them to leave the Catholic Church, and at first I gave him uh, Dave Hunt's book, uh, A Woman Rides the Beast, which is a good book if you're interested in a lot of history and uh, a lot of the Catholic doctrines and that are covered in Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. But uh, that book was kind of a turnoff uh, to my best friend. Uh, but after he read Dr. Lorraine Bettner's book, he left the Roman Catholic Church. And so, and so did his dearly departed wife. Uh, she died of cancer. Uh, uh, a few years later, but they both showed. We're talking about great courage, Martin Luther. It was. It took great courage for both of them. My best friend and his wife, his dearly departed first wife. Uh, it took great courage for them to leave the Roman Catholic Church. And a lot of people don't realize that often a lot of people, who, especially if they come from a large Roman Catholic family, and they're more of the uh, like my best friend, uh, if you come from German uh, Catholic, or we had a lot of German Catholics settled in my area, a lot of Irish Roman Catholic, a lot of uh, Polish Roman Catholic settled in uh, southwest central and at Pennsylvania. Um, we had a lot of them. And so they're famous for a number of things, like the Polish sausage and the, the ethnic food and stuff that they have. Uh, unfortunately, in my area of Pennsylvania here, a lot of them, and uh, it's not limited to just them, but uh, they were had a reputation for being very heavy drinkers. We're talking of alcohol. And, of course, my dad was uh, 
uh, from a uh, a very uh, uh, a devout Rome, well, devout Rome, fairly devout Roman Catholic family, and uh, they had a fair amount of. My bro, my dad came from a, a very large family, a lot of brothers and sisters, and uh, they uh, they were. And a lot of heavy drinkers, and my dad, of course, was an alcoholic all his life, and I hardly ever saw him growing up. But, uh, yeah, alcohol is a big problem, and we've mentioned that. Uh, I've been trying to watch the clock here, and uh, sure have do. we been getting close to about an hour and a half? Or I don't I'm know. I'm sure we... we're, we're past an hour and a half by now, Daryl, but there's uh, no better time than the present to continue then you know on on the uh on the path of um you know really declaring in every facet of our lives the importance of coming to the knowledge of the truth coming to the knowledge of the reformation coming to the repentance that and you know many nations came to repentance but do they teach this in the schools? Of course not. It's absolutely no. preposterous what's going on right now. And I think a lot of people are very angry, Daryl. And you know what? And there are people that are still looking for truth. And you don't whether you're non whether you're Roman Catholic or non Roman Catholic, truth a lot of people have given their lives or, and or risked their lives. Some have given their lives to get truth out. And sometimes it's only in the secular arena. Uh, a good example of that is Gary Webb, uh, who was suicided, uh, two shotgun uh, shots to the head. Um, uh, and there's lots of other examples of people uh, that have risked their lives and or given their lives to get truth out. Gary Webb was a, an award-winning uh, journalist and uh he was exposing uh, drug uh, laundering and uh, uh, arms running and all kinds of stuff. But he was uh, he was uh, kind of uh, he went after the CIA and uh, he he was murdered, suicided, I say, um, for his efforts. And there's been many people throughout history who have been murdered uh, for either pursuing the truth or putting the truth out or distributing the truth as many people who, as we found out uh, through our study of history, Brett and me and some of our friends, uh, that people, especially if they were trying to get uh, the Bible in the vernacular, as they say, what they mean is in, in a dialect or language that's not necessarily a cultured or uh, top diplomatic language or anything, but just trying to get it into the basic like English or German or Spanish that the common man understood and that were true to the, especially the New Testament, true manuscripts. And that's why um, we emphasize not only the Word of God, but the correct, the true Bible. And uh, that is the old, as we already mentioned, the old King James Bible, don't buy this lie that, oh, it can't, you can't understand it because it's a bunch of archaic words. No, there's a few archaic words in it, but it was a language that has a rhyme to it, that has a built-in dictionary to it, and it's the language that, that mis for missions uh, for, a couple, uh, for over a century, this was the language that the old King James Bible uh, that caused many missionaries to go out in the field. It was responsible for a lot of revivals. The newer Bibles can't claim that. The newer Bibles are based on some very faulty, between two to five, very faulty manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. And so that's what we're looking at right now is, is that uh, people like Luther risked his life to get it the Bible translated into German, the New Testament especially, translated into German, and uh, others preceded him. Tyndale risked his life, gave his life uh, to get the Bible. He wanted the Bible translated into English. And uh, we've had, as Brett pointed out, a lot of people risked their lives or gave their lives to give us a Bible in a language that we can read and understand. And for centuries, 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church wanted the people to be ignorant of the Bible because the Bible points out a number of things that, you know, shows that they're wrong, as I pointed out when I went through the catechism course. We're not supposed to call any man on earth our father. We're not supposed to spiritual leader. We're not supposed to do repetitious prayers like the heathen do. We're we're not supposed to, uh, we're supposed to have our bishops, elders, and deacons to be married to one woman and have their children in line. That stuff's all in the Bible. Now, I have to ask everyone, how much is the Roman Catholic Church following what God has commanded in the Bible? And that's why they have for centuries tried to uh, not only kill the people translating and distributing the Bibles, but they tried to burn all the Bibles that they could as fast as they could. And when they found out they couldn't burn the Bibles and the Bible-believing Christians fast enough, they decided to take a different tactic, and that was to undermine the true Bibles <clears throat> and to put out many of these false Bibles. And so that's what we're looking at today. And that's why we've emphasized on these, I call them YouTube sessions, recordings, YouTubers, we're emphasizing that we love Roman Catholics just the same as we love anybody, and we don't hate anybody. We don't like churches that, that try to be tyrannical and uh, and hate. They're the ones that are full. If they want to call anyone a hater, they're the ones that go around killing uh, between 50 to 100 conservatives. 150 to 100 million Christians have been killed by papal Rome through the centuries. And this stuff has been all forgotten pretty much. Like I said, edited, sanitized, taken out of our, our, our history textbooks, taken out of a lot of our encyclopedias through the threat of economic boycott, anything negative to papal Rome, like their heavy involvement in the murder of Abraham Lincoln, their heavy involvement in the fomenting of the American Civil War. And again, we've done separate YouTube sessions on those. We're just putting out history. Oh, now, how yes, is that hate? Still. Exactly. How's and and add to that, you know, our good friend and pastor, Bill Hughes, and his little wonderful book, The Secret Terrorist, where he tells you straight up, that they, mm -hmm. the plan of the Jesuit order was to get a central bank in the United States, and they sunk the Titanic with the three richest men in the world, yep. uh, Jewish, by the way, on board yep. the Titanic at the time. They sunk it on purpose to get the Federal Reserve System going. Because all could, three of those Jewish bankers were opposed to mm -hmm. a central banking system, and they knew it, and there's no way they could have got it through without them gone. So they needed yeah, a way to get rid of them gone, and they must have taken counsel together against God's anointing, as it says in the book of Psalms, chapter 2. Precisely the same thing, over and over and over throughout history. Nothing new under the sun, Daryl. Yep, as I said, they're they're not brilliant. These people, they're they're just they're stick they stick to it. They're mostly as and you've pointed out many times, they're just robots. Many of them are just robots. The lower and mid levels, of these orders, especially the Jesuits, um, they're corpses. They're told to be corpses and uh, unquestioned obedience to orders, much like the the Nazi SS, which by the way had. A, it wasn't really run by um, the pug-nosed uh, Heinrich Himmler. Uh, uh, they, it was the uh, his uncle who was a Jesuit priest that was the guy that was really in charge of the Nazi SS. And then we find out at the and of course that's a whole different. Uh, you can do an entire YouTube couple YouTubers on the heavy involvement of the church, which is brought out by a Roman Catholic journalist and Hitler's Pope book, Hitler's Pope, of how much involvement uh, that the Roman Catholic Church and hierarchy had, and at least for the, over the first half of the war, of World War II, in supporting uh, the Nazis, 
uh, the Nazi leadership and bring it in, bringing it into total power, and also all the the other fascist dictators like Mussolini and that in Europe. Uh, the church was behind them 100% at the start. The hierarchy of the church was, and that's brought out uh, very, very well in, by a, a secular writer uh, named uh, Edmund Paris in his book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, uh, which they can get from Chick Publications. It's a very good uh, book, and it shows how they fomented both World War I and World War II. So we, we've got problems here, folks. we got uh, people who have fomented World War One and World War Two, and it looks sure looks like they're trying to get fomented uh, a World War Three on steroids right now, uh, with everything that's gone on with Iran right now, and in uh, the Persian Gulf, you got the Russians and Chinese and the the Iranians doing joint naval exercises together. We got it. We need to remember that Iran is backed by Russia. Militarily, they're backed by China militarily. And so if we get into a world war, three on steroids with Iran, no matter how they bring it about, you're most likely going to have the Chinese and Russian co- Russians coming in on the side of Iran. They're, they have mutual defense pacts. And people, uh, you know, are... Well, we need to remember what Smedley D. Butler, who was from Westchester, Pennsylvania, I believe. One of my fellow Pennsylvanians wrote a book called War is a Racket. And lots of money gets made off of wars. And we go back to that uh, uh, Bible verse that I mentioned, and that's in, uh, I believe, First Timothy, if I'm looking here, First Timothy 6.10, where it says about the love of money is the root of all evil. A lot of money to be made from wars. So, I'm so glad that we're doing these YouTube sessions. We got this information out. Um, and I think that uh, maybe this might be a good thing for you to close it on. Uh, I think you said we have gone over an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. And uh, we covered a lot of ground. That's a great movie. And I would recommend that people watch it because you're going to see a very courageous Augustinian. He was a Roman Catholic uh man named, who be, uh, became a Roman Catholic priest also, uh, named Martin Luther, who courageously stood against both church and state in the form of the Holy Roman Empire and in the form of the papacy. When they were both wrong, he stood courageously knowing that he was probably going to pay for it with his life. And had it not been again for, for courageous uh, duke, prince, uh, Frederick the Third, the wise, uh, Luther would have been murdered. And so that's why I emphasize there and uh, these people of courage. So it doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or whether you're Protestant. If you show courage, you uh, seek for truth, you don't run away from truth, you don't hide from truth, but you deal with the truth and you tell others about truthful things like this movie, Uh, I tell people about this movie, Martin Luther, the 1953 black and white. It's in a DVD, a special 50th anniversary edition. I would watch that movie or find it wherever you can on the Internet. and Maybe you can find it some places and watch it for free. But I'll tell you, uh, watch it and then tell other people about it and say it's not anti-Catholic. It's not anti-anything. It's it's pro-truth. And that's what we're talking about, true history pro-true history, telling true history doesn't make you a bigot or a, a hater. Um, the people that are the haters are the people that go around murdering other people and carrying out, like I said, massacres and pogroms and that. And I think you'll agree 100% with that, and we can maybe close it off on that. 